talk with Harry Kim, our guest artist for the weekend. It's been fantastic. I hope you saw his master class yesterday and saw his concert last night. The master class was fantastic. The concert was great. So we decided we're going to go, since Rick couldn't make it, turn this much more into an inside the trumpet studio. Ah, good right? job. That's it. So we can get to know uh, more oh, about Harry, his career. You got to yeah, add actor there, too, because it takes a, the a little bit. The trumpet actor studio? A little bit of acting to make it in this business. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to start with some questions. I'm going to uh, jump from where we started yesterday in your master class and yeah. get, hear more about you and your career and how you ended up where you are. So. I, I teach a lot of kids, and uh, I hear a lot about everybody's, you, you see somebody who's in your place. Oh, he's on TV, he's out on the road, he's played with everybody. He must have just born with a trumpet in your hand. And I think at some point, uh, we want to know how did it start? Like, how did you start playing trumpet? Wow. Well, it started with f falling in love with the sound of the trumpet. When I was 10 years old, uh, I saw a movie on TV called Young Man with a Horn. I don't know if anybody's seen that, but if you have it, it's a must. Kirk Douglas plays a trumpet player. It's kind of really loosely based on Big Spider Beck, but it's actually, I guess, 40s, 50s type of thing and his struggles. And uh, Harry James played most of the trumpet solos on that. And I mean, right from the opening scene, you hear this trumpet, and I remember being 10 years old and going, wow, that's a beautiful sound, and I want to do that. So um, I remember that was, I was around 10 years old, and then I asked my father, get me a trumpet method book, because we couldn't afford to get a trumpet or anything yet. And so I started learning all the fingerings and stuff, and, and then I think I, I, I was 12 when I finally got my trumpet. My father bought it in a pawn shop for $18. <laughs> and the first thing I had to do, was, I knew the fingerings, but I couldn't get the notes. And then, of course, it was the beginning of junior high school. And that, that's how it all started. You know, we, we had a great music program in New York City. I, was, I grew up in New York City. And uh, they were very encouraging. And lots of music programs citywide. And they were funded privately along with the Board of Education. So they were citywide orchestras. They were like little local orchestras. They'd, and they'd put together one big one. And it was, it was really great. And that's how my romance started. Uh, it just... Everywhere I went, uh, I, I, we had AM radio back then. They were, I don't ne never heard of FM radio, and you know we're talking early '60s, and so pop music, pop radio was really diverse, you know, because you could listen to, you know, some teeny bopper songs, and then there'd be Frank Sinatra, and there was a trumpet player like, named Al Hurt who was having hit records at the time, and there was a German guy named Bert Kampfert who had hits out playing, but he, I found that he wasn't the trumpet player. He was, did you know that? No. Everybody always thought Bert Kempfert was the trumpet player. He was the band leader, but he didn't play like Red Roses for Blue Lady and all those things. Yeah, I thought he too, was you. the trumpet player as well. No, I found that he's not. He's the leader? He was the leader. Anyway, That's why so I'd be, you know, spending all these fanning the dial on the, on the AM radio, and as soon as I heard a trumpet, I'd stop to listen, you know, because it, it, was, it was obsessive. It was really weird for a kid to be obsessed with that. But I was, and I remember, um, I guess I was maybe 11 years old. Uh, there's this place in New York called Radio City Music Hall, and that was one of the last places that kept the old tradition of a live show with a live orchestra and band and then they'd show a film, you know, a current film, and they did this repeatedly all day long from morning till night. And I remember my, my uncle taking me to see a movie, and it was the first time I heard a live trumpet. I mean, it was an orchestra with, you know, like a pop type orchestra with four trumpets. And forget about it. As soon as I heard it live, it even got me more obsessed. So this, it's been like that. Yeah, I think that's why I tell kids, you know. So you got to fall in love with a sound and want to make it, you know, make that sound. I mean, for instance, trumpet, I can understand. Clarinet, eh, recorded? No, just kidding. Or well, the trumpet competition, I don't think you get a yeah. lot of argument there. So you're starting playing at 12 in yeah. middle school, right? So, right. But by high school, you're, you said you went to the high school performing arts. Yeah. So obviously you got, you got good pretty fast. I, I got, yeah. Uh, when I was in the seventh grade, you know, that's when I started playing. And two weeks later, I guess because I knew the fingerings and stuff, two weeks later I auditioned for the ninth grade orchestra and I got into the ninth grade orchestra. 
and uh, you know the. I, you know, I wish I would have stayed in touch with my junior high school teacher. He was a trumpet player. His name was Maury Shepard, mm -hmm. who was fantastic. He was a Rafael Mendes freak. And, you know, he, I'd ask him, play this, play, and he played all these Rafael Mendes solos for me. And, uh, it was very inspiring. He was a great guy. And then the year that I was in the eighth grade, the New York City Board of Education changed their, their system. So when I was in the eighth grade, I then had to go to high school. Because it used to be junior high school was seventh, eighth, and ninth, and then the year I was in the eighth grade, it changed to sixth, seventh, and eighth. So then I had to go to high school in the ninth grade, and then uh, I remember they had a special audition for those kids right. uh, uh, in the summer to, for for performing arts high school, and uh, anxiously waiting for the postcard, and finally came. You accepted. Okay, go over there and. Uh, and immediately they started having auditions for the high school all city orchestras, you know. And I went and auditioned, and by then, you know, I, I felt like I was a veteran at auditioning. <laughs> I, I, I had my arsenal of 101 impressive warm ups, and they had like a yeah, big auditorium with a whole bunch of trumpet players, and they're all warming up, and I'd go over there and do my, you know, and scare everybody. And uh, <laughs> but that's all I could do. I could play. <laughs> and I auditioned for the for that orchestra, and got in that orchestra. And I was the only freshman to be in that orchestra, or at least in the brass section. And see, I didn't know about competitiveness or anything like that back then. But uh, all the seniors in my school didn't take a liking <laughs> to me. And it took me years to realize why. <laughs> I imagine. You know? But uh, and they, they kind of bullied me around too. So I, I was, but anyway, huh. so I was in that orchestra for all those years. Uh, I should back up a little bit. When I was in junior high school, I was in, in the, those top orchestras also. And we got to play in Carnegie Hall. And they, in they, junior high? Yeah, uh, with the orchestra. It was a great orchestra, by the way. Wow. Um, and. Uh, it got so much support from the city. We'd get a huge spread in the newspapers, you know, photos and everything. So when, when in, the, uh, in the high school, all city orchestra, they did the same thing, televised, uh, live, and uh, newspaper coverage, and we played in Lincoln Center. Wow. Uh, and yeah, it was, it was huge, because they also had a, a citywide choir, high school choir, massive choir. And they had some pretty uh, dignified guys that were conducting and, and it was a great program. It was very inspiring. And uh, I should also add that it saved my life, you know, because where I grew up, it uh, deterred me from going into gangs and drugs and stuff like that. Sure. And uh, it changed my life. It saved my life. Wow. So, yeah. so then when, at that, when did you know, okay, this is what I'm doing? Oh, that was easy. Yeah, yeah it was really easy because <clears throat> As I said in my seminar, a lecture yesterday, you know, we grew up poor, so getting, trying to figure out a way to make, uh, make money to help out the family, it was, it was a must, it was a given, we all did that. So when I was 14, I put a band together, and, and we, uh, you know, through, uh, you know, different things happened, and one thing led to another, and before you know it, we're working every weekend, we're doing bar mitzvahs what, and weddings and stuff like that. What kind of band? It was a society band. We, you know, we'd play uh, Satin Doll, we'd play a little Dixieland, we'd play a little this, a little bit of the pop stuff. You know, it wasn't a rock band though. It was still, you know, it was something that you could work in a hotel lounge doing. You know, at the time, Bossa Nova was a really big then. Stan Getz, Girl from Ipanema, and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, we were working. And I should even add to this. Uh, you know, my first job was in a restaurant when I was 11. It started out as a dishwasher, and it was really hard work, you know, because they didn't have automatic dishwashers back then. It was all done by hand. It had three tubs, one with soap, one with a rinse, and another one rinse. And they had these gas heaters in there to heat the water. So I'd go after school, and there'd be a pile of dishes and pots and pans for the daily cooking and the lunches and all this stuff. So I'd get through that and wash all this stuff out, and, and then by the time I got done with that, there were dinner dishes to do. The piles. So you did that. Anyway, it was really hard work. I mean, do that six days a week and uh, minimum wage, I think back then was 45 cents an hour. 
you know. And, uh, but it was great, you know, make all this money. And then I'd give my mom, I'd keep $5 and give my mom the rest of it, you know. So for some reason, I guess it was like for security reasons, I kept those jobs because I went from one restaurant to another. And when I was 15, I was working in another restaurant part-time when I wasn't playing or rehearsing or something like that. And um, I saw the, the, the chef, you know, his name was Willie. He was going to go on a two-week vacation, you know, and uh, he was so happy this particular day. He was singing and cooking and having a great time, like on the cooking channel. He was so happy. And, yeah, so he went off to vacation two weeks. Two weeks went by like that. And I saw his face when he came back to work. That that face convinced me at that moment, and I was just about to turn 15, that I'm never going to work for a living. And I had music. I was already making money in music. And uh, the, his face, I still remember his face. He walked into work miserable. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's uh, hard, hard labor is, is like a prison sentence. You know, that's why I always encourage my son, you know, who's 22 years old, always that while you have time to make decisions about your life, it's, it's an amazing luxury. But as the years start going by, you start running out of that luxury, especially when you get married and have children. Choices are out the window. Now you got to do what you got to do. So I try to encourage young people to make your choices and make good choices before you get there before you run out of it, you know? Because I think it's a luxury to be able to say, I want to do this, I want to do that. And, and uh, it, you can't beat it. And I think one is, one is a great luxury to know what you want when you're really early. So as a parent, you know, as, uh, or you know, as an adult, I try to constantly bring it out in children. What do you like to do? Oh, you know, what do you like to do, you know? And this kid is eight years old, he liked to cook. So, hey, you ever think about being a chef at a, you know, a famous restaurant? Yeah, you know. But it, it, inspiring your children to do things outside of the box, mm -hmm. as opposed to go to college, get a business degree, go to work, you know, at an corporation. I mean, there's so much, so many other things in life than doing that. And I'm kind of the black sheep in the family, in, in the sense that, you know, my wife has a big family, and all her sisters and brothers think I'm weird because to them it's all academia do good in school go to college get a job you know I don't know you've done fairly well well yeah I mean because <laughs> it's so much fun to do right. what you do when you like to do it and you know as, as the old saying goes when you love what you do you never work a day in your life right and I wanted to save my son from a life of misery I didn't want him to look like like Willie you know uh, so I, I always offered up options for my son you could do this you could do that especially when i saw he liked something you know you could do this this career you know he's like seven no you can get a career in this and this and this his guidance counselor and all that. but i think it's important to encourage children to 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 find that in which they love Absolutely. i mean there's no pattern i mean they've tried to create a pattern in life for people in that, that's do good in school, go to college, get a job. Right. You know, but there's so much more. Think about your happiness. Think about what will give you freedom in your life. Uh, money and material things are not a priority. They don't have to be a priority when you're doing something that you love to do, you know, because then you're on top of the world when you, and you can make some money. I mean, I'm not rich, but I'm making some money. And, uh, and I could still do what I dreamt of when I was 10. Right. And so the, so yeah. you finish up at, at high school performing arts. You've got a band. You're working in New York. You've got some stuff, but you pick up and move to Los Angeles. Well, that wasn't my. Ch well, it was my choice because um, my father, who uh, was actually my father, was much older than my mom. He was born in 1899, and he always talked about when he uh, retired, he wanted to move to California where he grew up. So when when uh, it was actually. Right before my, my senior year in high school, he asked me if I wanted to move. And you know, high school, we had a recital. We had all kinds of stuff to prepare for. And me being lazy, I said, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> let's get out of here, you know. And it seemed like an exciting thing, because you know, my, uh, we grew up in the city, like I say, we are poor and everything, you know, concrete buildings and stuff. I mean, if you saw a park and a little patch of green, 
that was like, whoa, we're in the wilderness, you know, it's great. And uh, my image of California was like wide open spaces. Everybody could have a horse and the beach and all this kind of stuff, you know. Because uh, that's what you see on TV. So I said, let's go. So we moved to L.A. in 1968. And um, it turned out that it was, it was not what I expected. I imagine. L.A. was a really small town. 1968, if you drove in any direction within a half hour, you were out in farmland and wilderness. I'm not kidding. Places that are really populated now, like it was just farmland at one time, at that time. So, yeah. how, so how did the work begin for you there? Oh, uh, interesting. So I, I start high school in, 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 in L.A., the local high school, and their biggest emphasis was, was sports. They had virtually no music program. It was pathetic. You know, and LA is so big. They did have youth orchestras and stuff like that, but you had to drive for miles to auditions and all that stuff, and that kind of went out the window. And I was kind of like getting to be a rebellious teenager and kind of got depressed. So I'm, I'm getting a haircut one day down the street, and the, the guy's cutting my hair. So what do you do? I said, oh, I play trumpet. And he goes, oh, great, I play saxophone. Barber, right? <laughs> I said, Oh, wonderful. He says, we have a jam session every Thursday over in such and such place. And so I go to this jam session, and there's a bunch of Filipino guys. They're all playing, you know, jazz and stuff. And it was like in a movie because we're playing. And then the door opens, and this guy walks in. And everything stops, you know. And it turns out this guy, his name was Johnny Aquino. He was the top uh, contract, Filipino contractor in L.A. Because uh, uh, L.A. had a pretty big... Uh, Filipino uh, community. So this guy booked all the jobs for the Filipinos, you know, everything. And, and it, was, it was like in a movie, and then he sat down, nobody said anything. Guy moves to the piano, he sits down, and he starts playing How High the Moon, ding, 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 ding. and I join in, and, you know. And then uh, he goes, what's your name? What's your number? I said, before you know it, I'm working with this guy every weekend, right? And then I had to join the musicians union. Uh, so he took me down and introduced me to people in the Musicians Union, which reminds me that I may be due for a life membership now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, after a certain amount of years, you're, you're a life member, you don't have to pay dues anymore. But, um, so I started doing all these gigs, I joined the union, and the union back then used to have this thing called an exchange floor, where every day between one and four o'clock, musicians would gather in the lobby, and there was this lady named Billy Cutler, You'd give her your name, and I need a trumpet player for Saturday in Palm Springs. And she'd have this list, and she would announce it. Uh, need a trumpet player for Palm Springs on Saturday, meet somebody, you know, whoever, over there in the corner. <laughs> That's how they used to do it. In New York, they did that too. New York's a, a local 802, they used to use Roseland Ballroom for, that's how big that one was. Really? Yeah, it, there's a movie called, um, a film called Love with a Proper Stranger. Um, Natalie Wood and Steve McQueen. Steve McQueen plays a trumpet player. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, it's really great. But they did it on scene uh, in Roseland Ballroom. The opening scene is in Roseland Ballroom, one of these exchange floor days. And we need a trumpet player for such as Steve McQueen's running around. He's got his, he doesn't even have a trumpet, he's got a cornet case, you know. And then Natalie Wood walks up to him, excuse me, excuse me, and uh, do I know you? Yeah, don't you remember me six weeks ago? And that's how the movie starts, you know. It's, it's a really lo uh, lovely movie. And so it was an anti, uh, it was a pro-abortion movie, is what it was. Oh, okay. Yeah. But, uh, oh, actually, I'd have to see it again, because now, now I'm thinking maybe it was an anti-abortion movie. Yeah, it might have been. Anyway, that's not the point. But uh, you see a LA, local 802. And so I met this lady named Billy Cutler who ran this thing. And about three months later, I get a call, and she says, they're looking for a multi, to put together a multicultural band for a TV show. And they're having auditions on such and such day. Would you be interested? I said, sure. And uh, I went and auditioned for this band and uh, got this TV show. So I'm doing a weekly TV show, all of a sudden, um, where we were the house band, 
but we were featured on one number every show. And the show is a weird show, it's very conservative. In the middle of the hippie days, it was called The Square World of Ed Butler. And he discussed, you know, all this liberal stuff that was going on. And, 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 and so we, we'd play a song, uh, we'd perform a song apropos to whatever the subject was at the, uh, for that week. And this ran for two seasons. And uh, so we, we did, we, I, we got paid through AFTRA uh, for acting, and mm -hmm. we got paid through the Musicians Union, and, and that's when I started getting all kinds of recording experience, because I'd have to write the horn parts out and stuff right before the session, because I wouldn't know what song we were going to record till we get there. So I'm writing all these horn parts out and stuff like that, and recording it. And, uh, you know, one thing led to another, and, and then by the time I went to college, Am I talking too much? <laughs> no, that's why we're here. Well, by this, is, I, this is great. By the time I get to college, you know, I mean, I didn't even want to graduate high school, you know, my, and my mother talked me into, you gotta graduate high school, you know. So I graduated from high school, and then, you know, you gotta go to college. So I went to local college, and uh, this is right in the midst of the Vietnam War, so you go over there and this guy is in college that had been there for 10 years, you know, <laughs> in a junior college, just to stay out of the draft. You know, we called them resident students. And uh, so I'm in there in the college scene in uh, Los Angeles City College. It, it's like, when I think back, it's like a documentary movie. It's like, every day there were demonstrations on the campus, you know. They had all kinds of organizations, you know, like Black Panthers, uh, students for a Democratic Republic and all this. Just like you see in old documentary films, it's really weird. And I, I really, I, I, I'm not that old, really. It just, but it, it feels like it was yesterday and you see these documentaries, you go, geez, I'm old. But you know, they'd be burning uh, flags and all kinds of stuff, burning draft cards. And so, uh, uh, and the main reason really to be going to college at the time was stay out of the draft. And, uh, but I didn't like it. So I just decided to not to go. And I didn't realize it, but you had to withdraw from classes. I just didn't show up. Because they said, oh no, you're supposed to withdraw because you're gonna get all these fails. If you ever decide to go back to college, you're gonna have all these fails. So that's why I never went back to college. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't think twice. I, I, I was already in a band. We were doing top 40 music and, and uh, so, it was this decision to, oh, okay, I'm not going to go to school. I'm going to travel with these bands. We went to Vegas and started working in Vegas and all these things. And I mean, back then it was easy to make decisions like that because was, there, was, uh, there were so many job opportunities uh, in, in Las Vegas back in those days. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, see, the, the main uh, focus in Las Vegas was to make money in their casinos. And they gave away everything. Food was cheap. You could go see Frank Sinatra and Count Basie for like nine bucks. Uh, everything, the rooms were cheap, everything. But they, they, everything was designed so you get back out there in the casinos and spend money. You I know? think they're still designed that way, but they're yeah, not, they're but not now, making everything else as cheap. Yeah, so. they're not making it. Now it's corporate. Before right. it was right. less than corporate, I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> And really, and, and all they wanted was to make money, and it was called Sin City, because these junkets and groups of men would show up. Every day there would be a new group of thousands of men show up to gamble, and they would offer them everything they could to attract them to stay there and gamble. There were no families, you know. Uh, it was what we remember old Vegas to be like. And then uh, it, it converted into this thing where they, let's make Vegas a family place, roller coasters and amusement parks. And now they're realizing that the casinos aren't making any money, so they, they're trying to slowly convert it back to Sin City. You know? so, but anyway, back then they had these things called lounges. Every hotel had at least one lounge, sometimes two lounges. And, uh, and these lounges featured a 45-minute show of someone who was up and coming well-known, but up and coming, or someone who was well-known and on their way down. And uh, they would have shows in these, in these, um, in these lounges for four o'clock in the afternoon to four in the morning. And every act had two, depending on how famous you were, you know, if you were with a famous group, you were on prime time. So you'd have maybe one show at eight and one show at 10, you know, and that was your job, that's it. You know, the uh, lesser known groups or local, they'd start at four o'clock in the afternoon, play maybe two or three, 
You know, it was just a place for people to sit down, have a couple of drinks, and it was three dollars. Two drinks, three dollars, watch a 45 minute show. Get out, start another one like that. It was, and there were, every hotel had that. I mean, I remember you could go see, uh, you know, like I said, well, Count Basie played in a lounge in Tropicana with Joe Williams. Three dollars, two drinks, and you could see a set with, you know, and, and that was a big deal. So they had all kinds of showrooms. Some of them featured traditional music, some featured pop singers, and some featured just like uh, entertainment. And I was in a bunch of those groups. Uh, like James Brown reviews, like and Tina Turner reviews, a lot of dancing, and, da, 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 da. and those shows were designed to really get people roaring in 45 minutes, and then they're out, you know. And I played with a, a singer called Billy Joe Royal, who maybe you remember, from Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, he had a couple of really big hits back then, so we played like that. Uh, so, but. They, they don't exist anymore, like I say. When corporations came in, they got rid of all those uh, lounges. They put in Kino lounges, and, and, and so it's converted. Right. But from there, I, I was just talking about that with the guys outside. Uh, I was on the road with one of these bands, <clears throat> and they used to have these show bands all over the country, these uh, Vegas-type showrooms. Uh, it was a circuit of, of showrooms. So I was, I think I was in... Uh, somewhere in New York, like Rochester, New York, playing one of these big showrooms. And uh, I get a call, uh, you wanna come to Vegas and audition for the Harry James Band? And I said, sure. So I gave my notice with this band, they flew me to Vegas. And I gotta remember, Harry James is the guy that inspired me to play trumpet. He's the first trumpet I ever heard where I went, you know, Wow, you know, the choir, the sky opened up when I heard Absolutely. Harry James, right? So I go to audition and, and uh, we're playing. And we're playing um, a chart, uh, the theme from Summer 42, mm -hmm. you know, do, 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 do. And he happens to walk in during the shout chorus. I was playing lead on it. And, um, and then he walks in, he's got white hair. And, and piercing blue eyes. I mean, you could see from across the room those blue eyes. This guy was a star, yeah. you know, this huge star. And uh, so we finished that and then we took a break, the band took a break. And uh, the first thing he said, he walked over to me, he says, I want you to play all the lead on the ballads and walked away <laughs> and I went, Holy mackerel. Harry so that James. was, you got the gig? Well, no. Or, or you already had the no, gig at that no, point? No, no, like, I'm still auditioning, right? Auditioning? And this okay. is part of the story I was telling <laughs> no. I'm out three weeks with the band. They took off and went on a yeah. tour. And I'm like really anxious. I don't know. I'm nervous and everything. And, and I finally walked up to the manager. I said, do I have the gig? He goes, well, you're here, ain't you? <laughs> That's it. You know, I, I remember um, the, the, there was a, a trumpet player that played lead for Sammy Davis Jr. for years. Fip something, I can't remember his name. And, and it, the same thing happened to him. You remember who I'm talking about? I Fip, know who you're talking about. You know, and he said he went to audition for Sammy Davis Jr. They never told him he had the gig, and then, you know, 19 years later, he's still wondering if he has the gig, <laughs> you know? And then there's another guy, uh, Mike Natale uh, from Philadelphia, who, who they, they, you remember a show called The Mike Douglas Show, of maybe? Yeah? yeah? Well, it was Mike Natale, uh, Natale on trumpet, and Vince Trombetta, who is now the president of the Musicians Union in LA. They were the horn section on that show. And the same thing, he says that they went out, do, they went to do a pilot, and 20 years later, they're still doing the gig, and they're always wondering, when's the show gonna be canceled, you know? So things like that happen. I mean, yeah. you can make a whole career out of one gig. It's, it's pretty amazing. So how long yeah. did you stay with Harry's band? A year and a half. Oh, that's um, Yeah, I, after a year, I felt it was like, eh, it's kind of enough now. And, uh, but it was rumored that he was gonna become the musical director at this new hotel that they were opening up in Vegas. So I stayed around to see what the verdict was gonna be and then uh, they chose Cy Zettner. I don't know if you know him, a trombone player, they yeah. chose him. So then it was time to leave. Um, but it was interesting because the band that I was on, I mean, apparently he was really, really happy with the band. We had Sonny Payne playing drums. Wow. And it was a really exciting band. And I was with him in, in, in the room when he was talking to Betty Grable and found out she had cancer. And we were this close to each other. Everything changed from that day. You know, apparently he had a lot of, 
a lot of compassion and feeling for her and uh, his whole mood, everything. And I, and I remember leaving the band a few weeks after that and I heard that a lot of things happened after that. His whole demeanor changed and everything. And uh, it, was, it was something. Harry was an amazing guy. We, we, the third set would always open up with a tune uh, that they were open blues solos. Harry would sit in a little table with some friends next to the bandstand and guys would get up and solo on this tune. You remember this uh, slider or something like that, one of those. Uh, by the way, that's uh, Bill Hicks over there who was also with Harry James Band. With, not with me, but at separate times. And uh, so we played this, you know, this thing. And the trombone player decided one day he was gonna play outside. So he got up and started playing all this outside stuff. And we were like, whoa, you know. And, uh, and all of a sudden, Harry James gets on the, on the bandstand, picks up his horn, and played about six choruses where he sounded like Woody Shaw. I'm not kidding <laughs> you. He started playing all these words. You know, all this stuff he played. And he turned around and Bill, the, the, the trombone player, said, I never want to hear that shit again. He goes, anybody could play that shit. <laughs> and it was amazing, you know, because I'd always heard that, you know, that, that, you know, people wanted him to come aboard the jazz wagon, you know, and, and, but he, yeah, for many reasons, he st stuck to his, his thing playing what he did. He never got away from it. But that night he showed he could do that stuff. I mean, he sounded really modern and played some bebop and, and, uh, I'll never forget that, and, and, and he said, I never want to hear you play that shit. And, uh, so anyway, that's my Harry James story. That's, fan that's fantastic. Yeah. So you, you spent a lot of years on the road, but you wanted this, home was Los Angeles for you at this point. Yeah. So yeah. coming back, how do you then break into the studio scene, the work that's going on then that's developing when you first move there, but turns into a huge industry in the next couple of decades? You know, with me, I, I kind of went in through the back door because, see, I, I, I kind of touched on this yesterday, you know. Growing up poor, uh, there was a disadvantage in that I, I was socially dysfunctional. You know, I think maybe if I would have gone to college, I would have learned to work with others and, and this. But my whole thing and my whole life was being part of a band, putting a band together, or being part of a band, putting the horn section together, you know, writing for the horn section. So this is what I did. This is what I did. Harry James might have been one of the only gigs where I was just a side man. I didn't know how to be a side man. So the opportunities that I did have to play in the studios, if it was outside of my world, I kind of blew it because I didn't know how to behave. You know, there's a protocol, you know, um, yeah, and I find this to be true. And as, as a veteran, I could tell you, that there's a huge difference in the way different cultures behave and interact and even play, mm -hmm. you know. But the mainstream, and you have to learn how they behave, how they interact, how they play in order to be accepted, you know. It's, it's an interesting thing. By the time I learned this, I burned a lot of bridges. You know, to start with, for example, in, in the mainstream, the contractor is everything. The first people I have an argument with when I get to a job is with the contractor. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> you know. You know, and I'm used to writing horn parts. I'm used to, uh, you know, uh, helping the horn section out with interpretation and stuff. I go over there, sit there, and I'm playing third or fourth, and here I am opening my mouth. There's a lead player there. You keep your mouth shut. You know, I'm over there. Oh, no, 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 this should be like this. Or let's try it like this. <laughs> you don't do that, you know. And this is, you know, one of those things, you know, stylistically, I knew the styles because I'd been playing, you know, by that time I was playing Latin music with Tito Puente and, and all these guys. I'm playing, I've played funk music. I've done all these things. And then you get into a studio situation with a lot of studio musicians, and they're playing it right but not necessarily always with the right feel. You know, this is one of the things on the video uh, that I had yesterday with Harold Wheeler was talking right. about. They're playing the right notes, but it's not feel. So here I am, you know, I'm young and inexperienced, and I say, oh guys, no, let's play it like this. It's better if we go da da da, you know. And they're looking at me like, 
who is this guy? We don't want him here ever again. So the only thing that got me, and, and it took years to develop relationships with guys like Rick Baptist and all these guys, that uh, they realized now I didn't mean any harm in it. I wasn't trying to uh, draw attention. It's just the, the way I am, you know. <laughs> it, it wasn't any, out of anything else. And uh, so, you know, years go by and then you learn this. This is why I, I offered all this yesterday because these are mista huge mistakes I made, you know. And uh, so, that's how I got. So I, everything I did was on the on the, like almost parallel to to the other scene, but I was with the outcasts, with the musical directors, with the conductors, with the artists. You know, they'd want me because of some particular reason or something, and so I'd start doing studio work with them and doing this and this. One of the my that I, makes sense. Yeah, and one of one of the I think in anybody's career, there's always you run into a key person, one key person that helps you, and no matter what, if you're an actor, if you're you know, an up and coming uh, corporate guy or something, there's a key person that helps you. And for me, there was a guy named Ernie Fields Jr. who was a big contract in LA. Uh, he contracts uh, American Idol, the, uh, he contracts uh, 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 X Factor, The Voice, and uh, America's Got Talent, he contracts all this. But I became a friend of his way before he became a famous contractor. He was contracting back when I met him. But we became really good friends, and he's helped me out so much. He, I, I always tell him that he's either directly or indirectly involved with any major gig I ever had, mm -hmm. you know, because of somebody he introduced me to, I got this. Or, you know, he's, he's uh, majorly responsible for almost everything I did. Um, I was at a party, it was actually his 46th birthday, and he introduced me to a guy named Don Myrick. And Don Myrick and I got along really well. And he was original Earth, Earth Wind and Fire sax player. And he had a, and it was in a group called the Phoenix Horns and blah, blah, blah. Long story short, we got along real good. And uh, they needed a trumpet player for a gig. And he called Ernie. He says, uh, who do I get? He said, call Harry Kim. So next thing I'm going to do, I'm working with the Phoenix Horns. And I inherit all these great gigs that they had. They had a lot of international artists they used to record for in Japan and in Europe and stuff. So I'm, I'm on the road and still all of a sudden I'm working with them. I inherited the Phil Collins gig because of that. You know, Phil Collins always used this horn section. Right. And I just came along. There was no audition or nothing. I just got this gig. You know, I, I remember the first um, session we did was 1989 to do this But Seriously album. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you know, it's just like bam, 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 bam. Uh, one thing leads to another. Um, pretty much grace of God. But that Phil Collins, I, I, you, I don't know how many of you remember this record. I knew Phil Collins must be cool. I had that LP, oddly enough, um, because there was one cut on that that was about a minute and a half that was just the band and the horn section. Yeah. On a uh, pop album. I mean, Phil was, Collins was, if you guys don't know, he was the drummer for a rock group called Genesis, and then he went on a solo career, and was, he was a pop star. Huge, you know, top 40 pop star. But he always carried Phoenix Horns with his horn section, and I remember picking that up. It was called, I can remember the name of the But Saturday seriously, night, Saturday night, Sunday Saturday morning. Saturday and Sunday morning, exactly. I listened to this album going, wait a minute, he put an instrumental cut on this to feature the horns. It was yeah. great, it was fantastic. But then you, that turned into a long relationship yeah. with him because well, then he put, know, a, he put a big band together and other things like how did that how did that happen well we we did the uh, but seriously album in 1989 and uh and we toured it in 1990 all year it was a long tour um it was a great tour because i i had i got married in 1987 and uh always promised my wife a nice honeymoon. The 1990 tour was her honeymoon. 10 months around the world, you know, which Phil was really gracious and, and uh, she could travel with us and everything was cool. Um, they paid everything for her. And uh, I didn't know at the time, it's kind of uncool to bring your wife on a whole tour, you know, but I did that because I didn't know. And uh, we had so much fun and, we, and my wife got to meet, you know, leaders of different countries. She had conversations with Prince Charles and all this stuff, you know, while I'm over there playing. She's over there socializing with all these people. But it's great. 
So we did this whole tour, and then, uh, and then we were supposed to do a tour shortly after another tour. But then he got involved in a movie, which takes forever. It might have been, I don't remember, but he was involved in a movie. And then he was going to tour, and then, no, he went out with Eric Clapton for a year and a half. And then he was going to tour, no, he went out with Genesis. So the next time we toured was 1994. Oh, wow. So there was like three years of, of kind of having this carrot. But I mean, he had all intentions of touring, but these things came up. So uh, in 19, um, when he was with Genesis, 1993, he calls me, he goes, uh, I need a horn section. Because yeah. I, uh, I think what happened was the sax player, my friend Don Myrick, was tragically killed. And uh, so I don't know. He decided he would have tried another horn section. So he called me up. Can you get a horn section for me? I said, I already have a horn section for you. It's called the Vine Street Horns. We've been doing this. Oh, OK. Well, uh, and then he was playing Dodger Stadium with Genesis uh, the following, uh, within the next month or so. So he said, OK, I'll send you tickets for that. And, and you come down, and, and uh, we'll talk. OK. So my wife and I, we go to uh, Dodger Stadium. VIP parking right in the back, you know, it's great. So, and we go, we meet, we film. But the thing was, everybody, because he's very loyal, he keeps the same crew, everybody that works for him goes on him on all the tours. So my wife and I are back there, and they're all happy to see us, because we hadn't seen each other since the end of 1990. They're all talking like, we're going to do this tour. You know, it's like, it's a gift. And yeah, we're doing, I'm the only one that doesn't know. <laughs> So I says, Phil, hey, how you feel with blah, blah, And he was bombarded with celebrities. And so he goes, look, we're doing this tour. Get your horn station together. We're going to go on. That was it. Wow. You know, and so I had my horn section, the Vine Street Horns. And uh, we started a relationship with Phil Collins then. 1994 tour called the, what was the name of that tour? Both Sides of the World Tour. Okay. 18 months. Wow. It was fantastic. Yeah. You know, uh, again, you know, take my wife uh, <laughs> back there. Like, if we go to Germany, we'll, speak, we'll spend five weeks in Germany hitting different cities. So if I brought my wife and my son, who was, who was two, three years old at the time, you know, we're spending a week in every city. And it was really easy to move around with them because, you know, you take a train to the next city, sure. next city, next city. And then uh, we'd play uh, the United States. You know, of course. And when we played in the United States, we had a private plane going everywhere. So, which was a drag because we didn't get mileage, you know, it was really. <laughs> uh, but, you know, family traveled all over the place with us. And, um, and we'd go to Japan. We spent five weeks there playing different cities. Easy to bring the family. And uh, Australia, same thing. And 18 months of that, you know. Uh, I could only take four more years of this, you know. It's one of those. <laughs> right, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was fantastic playing for big crowds, and, and Phil Collins was at his, at his height at the time. Right. You know, sold out everywhere, and we were playing stadiums and arenas and all this kind of stuff. It was so much fun, and uh, 18 months of that, and then, then he goes, okay, this is 1995 now, the end of this tour, and and then he goes, we're doing another album next year, so uh, he he rented a mansion in Switzerland, and he set up a studio there, and we go, for, you know, they did the tracks and everything there, and then he flew the horn section over there, uh, spent a couple of weeks doing the horn parts, and, you know, we had our chef, private chef, to cook for us anytime we wanted, and, uh, so then, and then we do that, and then, and then we tour it, yeah. you know, and in 97, and uh, 97. I've got to keep track of this stuff. 97, we tour that. 98, at the end of 97, he says, I want to do a big band. What, how do we do this? And, and he wanted to do this and this and this and this and this. And I said, well, you can't do that. You can't go out in public. You're Phil Collins. You're going you're gonna to play these charts that everybody plays. You know, essentially, what he wanted to do was a rehearsal band, you know. Rehearsal bands, people get together and they rehearse a repertoire that's already been recorded by Count Basie or, or whoever, you know. I said, you can't do that, you know. Why don't we come up with a concept where we rehearse original arrangements? And then he goes, oh, great, we could do original great, uh, arrangements of, of Genesis and Phil Collins' song. 
So then, okay, now we're talking. So we started having meetings to select the music that he was going to do. And it was really kind of difficult because, you know, not all the songs, you know, were written in such a way like, like the great American songbook is where you have, you know, ver, you know ABA, right. you know, you have a bridge and everything like that. You know, these rock tunes were kind of like, bam, so how do you develop into, into uh, interesting arrangements, you know? Because there was no real bridge, or was, you know, something like that. So, uh, so then I had to decide what which would be the best arrangers for each particular tune. So I ended up using like four or five arrangers to do different things. He wanted this one tune to have a Count Basie sound, so this is a perfect tune. I called Sammy Nestico, and he came and he did a couple of arrangements too, and. Uh, he was this one too, it was a big production type of tune, so I called the guy who arranges for the Tonight Show, for, for the old Tonight Show right. with Doc Servinson. Yeah. <laughs> he did it one. So I was like that. So Phil Collins doesn't read, so he had to li hear the music. So we organized a big band in LA, and we had a big session recording every chart, you know. And so we recorded every chart, and uh, and then it got sent to him on a, on a disc, and it was the first time he had ever heard it. There's a really good documentary on this. Um, uh, Phil Collins' big band, it's, I think it's called Genesis Archives. That's, that's the name of the website, Genesis Archives. And, and it's the Phil Collins' big band, and it documented everything that happened, how we got it together, oh, that's fabulous. how it took for him to learn these charts. Wow. Every one of them, because he doesn't read, he doesn't write. So you had to memorize this. They showed rehearsals with Quincy Jones and everybody. It's, it's a fun document. I mean, maybe because I'm in it, so it seems fun. <laughs> it might not be. <laughs> no, it sounds but, great. Um, yeah, making a Phil Collins big band, Genesis Archives. And we used the WDR Orchestra from Germany, famous mm -hmm. big band, great big band. <clears throat> and so that's, uh, that's 1996. Oh, that was 1996. So after we recorded the, uh, his pop album, we, we started with that, the big band. 97, we, um, we toured the, uh, the pop album he did in 96. 98, we did a second big band tour, which, um, uh, which we used uh, Ron Modell, mm -hmm. who was professor of music Northern at Illinois. Northern Illinois. Yep. So he called a bunch of his alumni and put this terrific band together. And we toured it, and that was 98. And then this other guy walked into our lives. Uh, There's a guy named Johnny Halliday, H-A-L-L-Y-D-A-Y. -L -L right. This guy, nobody's ever heard of him here, but he's a French icon. He's the biggest pop star in France. You know, he, you know like when they make a list of things French, he's above baguette bread and wine. <laughs> I'm not kidding, you know. It's Johnny Halliday, baguette wine and on. Johnny Holiday, and he's, he, he's proud of this, but I think it's a mistake because he, people call him the French Elvis. When we think of Elvis, we think uh, French Elvis, we think he's an Elvis imitator. And uh, he doesn't realize that actually maybe it hurts him in this country. But the reason they call him French Elvis is because he was a contemporary of Elvis. Um, he was a really good looking kid, 16 years old. Here's Elvis. Here's uh, Johnny Holiday. Johnny Holiday started bringing rock and roll to France. So a lot of the Elvis tunes that, that Elvis did here, he did them in French. And then this guy, he's 70 now. He, he just celebrated his 70th birthday last year. He's still huge, you know. But his career has evolved as the years went on. He brought, he brought um, rock and roll to France. He brought R&B to France. He brought, I mean, uh, Jimi Hendrix was in his band. Jimi Hendrix had a band that opened for him. The Beatles opened for him, I think. That's been rumored wow. that he opened for, they opened for him. I'm not sure if that's completely true. But uh, with Jimi Hendrix, when he wrote Hey Joe, you know that? Uh, mm -hmm. So he called Johnny to England, and Johnny recorded a French version of that song when they did it, and they were both released at the same time. And Hey Joe was a huge hit in France. Hey Joe was a huge hit in the Western world, you know. So, and then because he became, you know, such an icon, 
all these composers and pop composers all over France start writing songs for him. So he's got these power ballads. He's got, I mean, his catalog is, is, her, is you know, from 1957 to now. And, uh, and there's nobody more famous than Johnny Holland. And then there will be. So we started a relationship in 1998. Uh, early on in 1998, his people called and he said, we want the Vine Street Horns. We saw you guys uh, with Phil Collins uh, the year before. Uh, okay, well, good fight. So, uh, so we negotiate and we start a tour with him. Uh, the first gig we played, man, was like uh, the Stade de France. He was going to try to be the first act to play the Stade de France because the Stade de France was brand new. I think it was built for the World Cup or something. I think that's right. Right? And then I think Elton John beat him to it or something like that. Somebody like that got the first gig. But we had 98,000 people four nights in a row in, in, uh, in the Stade de France. And it was huge. It was the biggest thing I'd ever seen. This gigantic stage that uh, with a runway to the middle. I mean, it was big enough where he could ride his motorcycle, his hardly, through the stage <laughs> and stuff like that with ramps going up, fireworks. It was just, it was pretty amazing. So we started working with him in 98. We did a tour with him in 98, 99, 2000. And uh, what was on? I forget what was going on with Phil, but he didn't do anything again until 2004, 2005. So we were busy with, with Johnny Holiday from 98, 2000, 2000, uh, 2003. We did another huge tour. Then 2004 with Phil again, 2005, and since we've been doing more tours with um, with Johnny Holiday. So between the two of them, they you know they kept my house payments. So. That's fantastic. No. We're getting to a point where you spend a lot of time on TV in the past, especially the past decade. So, you know, I, I want to do two things, and I'm sure we're thinking about this. This is great. I'm, I, I, I'm enjoying this so much. Um, I'm glad tell us what, <laughs> to, you've done award shows, you've been on the Grammys and these kind of things, which is a, a one-shot live television broadcast, and you've also done American Idol for seven seasons, which is a week-to-week, -week, you know. Tell us what that's like. What's that like backstage? We see the final product. We, we turn on the TV. And wow, everything looks pretty, and the band sounds great, and everything's going. How does it? How does that get to put together from your side? And and the week to week, like looking at American Idol. You know, we see, and I, I know musicians are fairly mixed on American Idol uh, from the contestant standpoint, but from a band standpoint, we're all going, wow, that band sounds fantastic. Well, like how do those things get put together? First, I got to talk about the the musical director, Ricky Minor. Mm -hmm. I. Um, I, I would say that he was solely, re, solely responsible for bringing live music back on TV. And I'll tell you, I have to go back a little bit in history with this, but there was a time when we did a lot of, a lot of TV and TV specials backing up different artists. And I thought it was late 70s and 80s. Again, because of Ernie Fields, I would get on these, these TV shows. But then, when technology started really coming into mainstream and all this, when artists, their backup tracks were solely synthesizers and all this, yeah. live music got phased out. I remember doing, um, for instance, we would do the Lou Rawls Parade of Stars every year, which was a big variety show where we would uh, pre-record all the acts and, and then they'd have a telethon yeah. uh, raising money for the NAACP, no, what was it? The, United Negro College, UNCF. That's right. Yeah, right. it's a great show. Right, and it was a great variety show, but and it, and it was designed such so that it, it appeared like everything was live, but it wasn't. We recorded all the acts a few months before, and then put it all together, and then they'd have this like 18-hour telethon when they were raising money, and they'd say, "Oh, now let's go to the studios there where Frank Sinatra is going to perform," and then they showed a video, you know. So that used to be six days of work solid work. Uh, rehearse uh, with the artist and then pre-record. Next act, rehearse, pre-record. You know, six days of that. But after the second, third year, it went down to five days because acts started bringing their, their CDs, their tracks. And then that turned into three days because more and more acts are bringing in their tracks. And I'm talking about the young guys. I'm not talking about, you know, Frank Sinatra or anybody. They didn't bring tracks, but it was the younger artists bringing their tracks. 
So after a while, it was like one day, maybe three hours. Well, or it was just one act that needed a live band. So a good portion of the 80s, no live music. Mm -hmm. Good portion of the 90s, no live music. I mean, uh, all these acts, they had the <laughs> and it's all this pre-recorded electronic music and stuff, and they couldn't find a band that could play this stuff, so they preferred to use their tracks. You know, here comes Ricky Minor, and, and this goes way back before American Idol and Tonight Show. He starts working for these TV shows, TV specials on BET, you know. Mm -hmm. And he and these young guys come on, they want to use tracks, and Ricky says, no, you're going to use the live band. They don't want to. But Ricky had handpicked musicians in his rhythm section that could duplicate any record. They're, you know, like the Teddy Campbell, the drummer, great drummer, you know, from a drummer standpoint. Sonically, he, his sounds and everything, his technique is of the, the drum machine generation. So a lot of the stuff that you hear, you know, on, on, on some of the earlier tracks where you got these complicated, you know, all this kind of stuff, they, they could do it because they had a drum machine. Most drummers couldn't do that. Ricky's drummer could do that, you know. The synth player had all the sounds. And it, so one artist, one at a time, we're doing all these little, little BET award shows and specials. He's convincing one artist at a time you could use a live band. Hmm. And they, they're, they're shocked because a live band, it sounds like Mike Merkert, and better because now you've got live energy going right. up. So, Aside from the fact that he's doing that, now he's building a great relationships with artists, you know, which is, he's, he's great at, you know. And so he's doing all these shows, and one day uh, he's, we're doing this show called Women of Rock or something like this. And uh, Kelly Clarkson, the first winner, she mm -hmm. just won American Idol, she's one of the acts, and Ricky's going to back her up. So the Idol people come and watch the show to support her, and they hear Ricky's band and they, get, they fall in love with the band because for the first three seasons of American Idol, they're using pre-recorded tracks. Right. You know, they'd get a, a, a studio band to come in and record the tracks, and then the singers had to sing it, no matter if it's in the wrong key for them or what, nothing, they just come in. It's like a factory, you know, they come in and do this. So they want Ricky Minor, and Ricky Minor insists it has to be live music with the band on stage. And that was the uh, landmark moment, I think, for TV again because live music on stage, it, it, I mean, I really think the whole live music on Dancing with the Stars and all these other shows that came after that were a direct result of the re audience response to, to, to the uh, American Idol, mm -hmm. you know. So the thing about American Idol is that, uh, you know, now because we had a band on hand, it wasn't all like the contestants had no, I don't, I'm not sure that they had a lot of say you know, it was like, okay, they record this, now you gotta sing it. But now the contestants started getting involved with the arrangements, and I don't wanna do it like the record, I wanna do it more like a, a blues or so, you know. So there was more interaction between the band and the artists, and that, that formula started working out really well, and uh, as far as, it was long, ruling schedules. I mean, early on, when, when, when the season starts and there's a lot of contestants, uh, we would start rehearsing Friday. I mean, if the, if the show was to be aired on Tuesday, say, that was early, because now I think they do Wednesday and Thursday. But if, if the show was to be aired, we'd, we'd start rehearsing on Friday. You know, uh, we'd, we'd run all the music down, we'd try to edit it so that it, it sounds hipper, you know, because a lot of times you get an arranger to write. And there's another thing, you know, there's another mentality. You know, you get an arrangement, you read the arrangement down, you record it. But in this, in this scenario, and in most of the modern scenarios today, like with Dancing with the Stars and stuff, you get the arrangement, and now, now let's tweak it. Right. You know, the arranger's word is not the Bible, you know. Let, let's make it different. And, and so we spend time doing that at rehearsals. So if, each, if there's 12 contestants and each one are doing two songs, there's 24 songs. So we spend all day Friday, Saturday, running down and tweaking all the arrangements and everything. And then, then Sunday, we start bringing the acts in to rehearse them. And, uh, and then Monday, we would rehearse all day. We'd, we'd start early in the morning, sometimes eight in the morning, 
rehearse until maybe one o'clock when the artists come in, and we gave uh, each 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 singer got a certain amount of time to rehearse their song, and then we'd rehearse it and then record a track for them to practice, and we'd go down to twelve the twenty four songs, you know, and that was a long day. Monday was an incredibly long day. Tuesday we go in. And if there's any tweaking to be done, depending on that, we'd get there real early again and uh, rehearsed amongst ourselves. And then we'd start a dress rehearsal at one o'clock or something like that. We'd run the whole show down. This is for camera blocking and everything. Run the whole show down and, you know, and then take a quick dinner break and then do the show live. And wow. it's, it was- That's uh, grueling. It was grueling. A lot of hours. It was a lot of hours. And uh, Ricky was great at it. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, you know, and still is. Still is. Absolutely. Yeah. So you've done a lot of live performing and a lot of studio stuff. And you talked a little bit earlier about you go in, and you called it a mistake you made, but I understand what you mean by it's right, but it's maybe not exactly how you would perform it live in a certain style. Right. It was so well, no, what I meant yeah. by that was that, you know, you, you commission or you, you sign a, an arrangement to somebody. He writes uh, either... In American Idol, for instance, in that case, he writes what he hears on an on a original track, but you, you might give him instructions. Yes, but we want to do it in a 6-8 or 12-4 or 12-8 or something, and we want it to sound more bluesy, so then he writes it. And then, then we rehearse it, and then, you know, because the arranger has nothing to go by. He's just got certain unspecific oh, oh, subjects. Yeah. Oh, no, I mean, it's like you said, you, when you were doing studio stuff and playing third, you might oh. have some opinions to voice here and there, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. which I understand coming from, you may have had more experience performing that style live than, than other people who were there at the time. So people often have talked, and I've heard trumpet players talk about this, that there's a, a, a difference between how you would play live and how would you play in the studio. And you've done a lot of both. Do you, do you see a difference in how you approach something? And if so, what is it? Or, or if not, why not? Uh, sort of question. I think the only difference for me is when you're performing live, there's a, there's adrenaline involved. Mm -hmm. Because you're hearing this stuff live, and it's like, it's really exciting. You know, when you hear the drummers, you know, the cymbals crashing and everything, you know, and, and an audience screaming, adrenaline starts to work for sure. you, you know. And there's where you're more apt to make mistakes. Because you get distracted, you get overly eager, and, oh boy, this is so much fun, crack, oh. <laughs> I mean, a good studio musician, you know, a good one, will not let that affect them. I'm not that good. I get affected all the time <laughs> by the audience. And, the, you know, so I'm distracted, man. I'm playing and I'm having so much fun. But, I, you know, it's about as much perfection as you can have. But to bring some kind of, project some kind of fun in the music. In the studio, uh, you have to manufacture that in your body. Because right. a lot of times you're not playing live with the whole band. You're right. hearing a track in your headphone. And now, you know, you gotta get into it. And, and, and now you, you manufacture that. It doesn't just happen because of your, your environment. It happens because you have to conjure it, you know. And of course, the priorities in a recording studio is, is, is try to be as accurate as you can. And, and my first takes all the time, like I'm trying to interpret, figure out stuff that probably we should do that's not written in the part, you know. Right. Uh, you know, because a lot of times the arrangers, you know, he might write a thing like da 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 da, you know, and he doesn't say accent the last note. And a lot of studio players will not accent the last note if it's not written, you know, so you know, da 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 da, you know. And I, I'm always thinking like a drummer, man, if a drummer would go, do 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 do, pop. He'd hit that last note with a little extra something. So, you know, if I have any say, I'll say, hey guys, put an accent on the last note. You know, or put a band on this note. Do do da 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 da. You know, a lot of guys, if it's not written, they won't do it. So do do da da do da da. You know, so, let's give it a do do da da. You know, great. Let's do that. You know, my first take is always like, oh, this. Some things here that can personalize. And that's always been, you know, as a horn section guy, and not being a good side man, I've not been a good, you know, studio guy, you know, I'm always thinking about stuff. And one of my concepts about horns is 
It's an every man for himself. You get your team together, you're going to have horn section together, and you got to play that music like nobody else is going to play it. Mm -hmm. And that makes you indispensable. You know, like right. Phil Collins, to use just any horn section after he's used to hearing what we've done with his music, you know, personalizing it, putting little bends here, little falls here, adding little things here. You know, that's not written. We do that, and, and he notices, because everyone's only rehearsing, he'll turn around and go, oh, like that, you know? Then you get another horn section comes in, and they won't do it, you know? So uh, it's my way, and this is a group, my, my group mentality, my garage band mentality, always make something better than it's written, if you can, or at least make it different, or interpret it according to how you feel about music, you know? And when I coach, sometimes I coach uh, uh, horn sections, they, they want me to come and listen to them. And the first thing I say, you guys sound like a marching band, you're just playing the notes. You know, what good is just playing the notes? You know, I approach a horn line like a solo. You know, if you have something like a right, that's the horns. All right, guys will come in and play, you know. But you gotta think, man, this is a linear, this is a linear thing. It's as if, there was a soloist behind the singer. He sings his phrase, now this line. If you were a sax player, be, one sax player behind uh, uh, Bruce Springsteen, how would you play it now? You know, so it's not da 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 you know, and you might add a in the dynamic thing. You know, now you're a soloist. Well, you're a horn section, you're a soloist. Think of yourself, the five of you, as a soloist. Now get into that mentality, now that line comes up and play it like, you know, and you talk about it for a second, put a bend here and a, a subito piano on that note and then crescendo in here and then, and then you go Now this line came to life and nobody else will ever play it like that. That makes you indispensable, it guarantees your job. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's a lot of reasons for it, this is more fun, it, there's a creative outlet there you know, okay, I'm, I'm not a soloist, I'm really not a soloist, but my creative outlet comes in arranging and, and guiding a horn section through some, uh, you know, inter an interpretation and all this kind of stuff. And making my chart sound good, making somebody else's chart sound like he didn't know it could sound a lot of times because they just didn't know, they didn't know the horns could do this or something. And, um, and that's what I feel is I get really excited, as you can see, yeah, <laughs> talking absolutely. about it, because you could do that. And I tell horn players all the time, you could do that, little, 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 analyze your parts and stay, you know, not just arbitrarily, but think of it, this, this is a, a melodic line. Why are you going to play it like a marching band? Da, 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 da. And most people will do that. Yeah. Most people would do that, and that's the difference between, you know, people who are like, I say, this is my specialty, pop music, right. you know, and, and, and small horn sections. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a difference between the way you play in a small horn section than you do in a big band, big difference, you know. Uh, but in the, the way you read the music, the way you interpret it, and all that, it's got to be that way. You know, um, I work for a composer named John Powell, who does a lot of film dates. And he has his brass dates separate from the string dates because he takes a lot of time to personalize the brass parts. Hmm. And, and, and we'll spend a lot of time on stuff, whereas normally you would just play, bah, 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 bah. you know, he'll go, no, no, let's, let's do this, let's add this. And he's really into personalizing lines. And I, I think, uh, there's room for that in music. Music doesn't have to be cut and dry, but because of time and budget, people got used to the fact that just play the right notes. Just play the right notes. And I think that in a lot of cases, the passion is budgeted out of music. Hmm. Uh, because there's, there's so much more stuff you could do to music. I mean, I always see, you know, you got a whole note in a piece or in a, in a horn part, and that whole note's gonna lead to a modulation or a different chord or something. It's just a whole note. There's no dynamic mark. But a whole note can have life. 
you know, and I always encourage like my section or a section that I may be leading, you got this whole note, give it a little lift before the next note. Da, da. That, I mean, you could hear it, when you hear it back, you could hear the difference, and you could also feel it. There's this thing of, you did that to the note, you gave life to this whole note, that most people will just play a whole note without changing the dynamics of it, you know. Um, there's a lot of stuff, like I said about the, you know, different emphasis on different notes when you're playing jazz or swing music or, or R&B. Mm -hmm. Not all the notes are equal as far as intensity, you know. Uh, that dynamic might not be written. Probably won't be written. And 99% of the bands will be ba da 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 you know. And I mean, if you're, if you have any consciousness or, or, or any kind of sensibility about being a soloist, how would you play it then? Right. Now you get a whole trumpet section. You go. <clears throat> now the band came to life. You know, people always say the greatest band they ever heard is swinging his band's Count Basie, and they say, well, why don't you play that way too then? You know, all these guys with big <laughs> bands. You know they. But play like they played, you know, because it does swing. Personalize this stuff. Take rhythms and, and, well, if you were a soloist, how would you play this? You got a whole section, turn it into a soloist section. No matter how small the part is, it means something. I mean, it, it, just like uh, having a great drummer that knows exactly what to play right before you hit. You know, that, it, that's just as important, knowing exactly what notes you gotta, you gotta emphasize. And that only comes from, like something I talked about yesterday is becoming an extrovert in music. You know, you're in college, you're in school, and you're, you're practicing for a festival or something, you got big band charts. Take that chart in the privacy of your own bedroom, close it, and go nuts on it. Because you have to learn to connect the mental with the physical with the emotional. You know, you're gonna be sitting there reading parts and dee -dee 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 -dee, you know, let's just go nuts. Yeah, lose your inhibitions, close the door, nobody's going to see you now. You know, start to emote passion in your music. And I think that's one of the biggest things that people are missing in music, in performance, is passion and, uh, and uh, exuberance. You know, yeah. it's just too much by the notes. Okay. No, I got way off track in there. No, you didn't. <laughs> not at all. I think that was that was great. You no, know, we are at a, a national trumpet competition, trumpet convention. We haven't talked a lot. Just trumpet, trumpet. So, you've had a very successful career performing an awful lot, being on the road, being at home, being on the road. Are there things you do to keep your trumpet playing together on a daily basis, regular basis? Like, how do you practice? I practice as least as I can. <laughs> Now, my, my whole mindset, and I think we were talking about that yesterday, you know, I had a, a big uh, problem with my chops uh, back in 97. Long story, I had some molars removed, and suddenly I couldn't play the trumpet. I couldn't play, I couldn't play high C. And if I had to play it, it was just purely intent and brute force. But it wasn't easy, and uh, I knew it was my teeth because it, it never felt good after I got the teeth out, you know. If I had a bad day, maybe, Maybe, but it'll come back, or at least have one good day, you know. But it, it just fell apart. So I started searching and searching and searching and figuring out what's different, what changed. And I, and I, and I got in this mindset of, you know, I, well, I found out what was wrong, you know. I had the two front teeth missing, so my tongue has a tendency to spread a little bit uh, when I play. So they kind of lean against my top teeth when I play, <laughs> like that. And when those teeth were missing, my tongue shifted forward to lean on the next set of teeth. I mean, it took me about five, six years to figure this out. It, it leaned forward, and it changed my airstream, made everything, everything I did about playing trumpet changed, and I couldn't play. I mean, it was really hard. And so when I discovered that was it, then I started developing uh, a practice routine that enabled me to move my tongue back and bring the front of my tongue down. To, uh, I was obstructing the airstream in the front because my tongue was so far forward. So I developed a routine and a mindset of 
Well, what I did was I, I made a checklist of things I do when I feel great and things I do when I feel terrible. And uh, it was really weird because if I went down a checklist, when I felt terrible, I, I would go down the checklist and change things and all of a sudden I'd start feeling better. And, and out of a thing, of maybe a list of 12 things that I do when I feel good, I started scratching things off because I found that if I did this, it took care of that, you know. And so then I, I got three things on my list now that I watch every day. Because I, I got to start with this by telling you, I'm not a natural trumpet player. It, it's really hard. It was really hard for me to learn how to play trumpet. You know, I'm not like Rick Baptist, for instance, natural. I asked him, you practice a lot? Did you practice a lot? And he said, no. You know, he doesn't even warm up. He goes to a session, and he, warm, and he warms up a little bit, and he's ready to go. I was never able to do that. You know, obviously guys like uh, Arturo Sandoval, you know. Wayne Bergeron, man, when he was in junior high school, he was playing double Cs, you know. I couldn't play high C in junior high school, you know. And so I, I, it was all intent. I want to do this. You know, I'm not going to stop for trying to figure it out. So during this time, I got into this mindset of searching. So now, everything that I do when I practice uh, is, is I, I don't call it a warm up, I call it maintenance. I know what I gotta do, and I consider it like a sax player where I'm looking for a good read. Because warming up is one thing, but really maintaining is another thing. I find that a lot of trumpet players don't know how to warm up. They do a little of this, they do a little of that, and then they go on a job, and all of a sudden they have to play a high G. They could play two or three of them, and then they're out of whack, and they're tired, and they can't play anymore because they didn't find a good read. You know, finding a good read means every register, every partial has a feel that you have to, you have to develop every day, you know, unless you're a natural. I'm one of those guys, I have to learn it every day and, and get that sweet spot happening. And once I find it, it feels pretty good. Um, and guys don't do it. So I call it maintenance routine. I, I think warm-ups, uh, warming up by rote, I think it's senseless. You know, okay, my teacher taught me how to go do dee 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 do 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 So you do that, it, you, you know, it's really important to self-analyze and know what you're doing when it's feeling really good. Because the day doesn't feel good, if you don't know what you're doing when it feels good, you won't know how to fix it. And, and that's happening to a lot of trumpet players my age right now. They're having trouble playing the trumpet and because they were naturals, they didn't know what they were doing right to begin with. So now they can't fix it. And they're, they're kind of conceited, they, they, uh, they, uh, they, they accept the fact, oh, I'm getting old, uh, it's time to retire or something. You know? It don't have to be that way because you just don't know what you were doing right. So I think it's really important for everybody to analyze. You know, they say an analysis creates paralysis, and I, I don't believe that because, you know, when you're doing something and you want to experiment, say, you know, with your tongue level or the the width, uh, how wide you apart your teeth are, or the angle of your horn, or stuff like that. I think it's a great thing to experiment because you might stumble onto something that makes pl playing trumpet easier. But the thing about it, creating paralysis, is if you think about too much, and 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 persist too much on a certain thought, you know. With me, it's real simple. You try something, it works or it doesn't work. If it doesn't work, forget about it. Don't let it paralyze you. Okay, I mean, it's how simple is it to do an arpeggio? Do, 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 tilt that way. That nah, didn't work. Do, 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 that didn't work. All right, let me, let me try my tongue. Let me go up. Oh, that worked really good. Now just put that on your list. I, did my, I moved my tongue a certain way when I was going up. It made the high C a lot easier. Or, or you know, you're going up, let me try closing my teeth a little bit as I go up. Do, do, do. Oh, that worked really good. Let me put that on the list. You know, and then you start incorporating that in your practice, in the rest of your warm-ups, in the rest of your exercises. You want, you know, it's a conscious. I don't believe that exercises or any system really works unless you have something going for you. You know, and I and I, I believe that that exercise. It's not like a treadmill. You get on a treadmill, you just walk and you watch, you listen to your iPod, and you start losing weight. You could do exercises all you want on the trumpet, and may never improve. It might not help you at all, because you have to have a purpose for doing this. You have to have, a, you know, a, you have to target a feel. You know, I, I believe in playing my feel. You know, everybody says, play for sound, play for sound. You know, your body will produce 
you know, I think that's a bunch of BS. Because you, you develop your sound at a certain point. You're not gonna sound like that from your practice room to the, to the, to the hall, to the you know, nightclub. It's not gonna sound like that. And I tell you, as a professional, 75% of the time you don't hear yourself. So why are you gonna practice sound if you don't hear yourself? I, I believe that you practice for feel, you know. Um, you know what it feels like to play, so now you have to be confident that if you don't hear it, you're not gonna overblow. See, I made that mistake last night, I started overblowing, because I couldn't hear myself at all on the stage, you know. So I started overblowing like crazy, but that was adrenaline. You know, my adrenaline got in, I started overblowing, and my chops got a little weird. But, you know, the whole thing about playing by feel and have confidence that you're playing loud enough. This is what it feels like when you're playing at your optimum, you know, volume. And then you, you, uh, you develop a feel. So when you, when you warm up, it's not just do these routines. It's pay attention when you're warming up from one register to another. Pay attention. What are you doing different today? You know, I, I don't have stiff days. You know, talk about stiff days. I don't believe in that. The only reason you have a stiff day is because you didn't find a good read. And if you didn't find a good read, it's because that day you didn't warm up properly. Or you weren't thinking about it. Or you don't know what you're doing when you feel good that you can fix it. I mean, I'm doing something sometimes, and I'm in the middle of a shout chorus, and I'm going, oh, this feels like shit. You know, I'm playing. And then it goes, oh, my, my mouthpiece is too low. Pick it up. I feel like a brand new trumpet player. Or, you know, that's one of my check. It doesn't mean that everybody has to have their mouthpiece up high or nothing. But, you know, that happens to be one of my checklists. My, my, my amateur, my, my uh, mouthpiece gets too low sometimes. Sometimes it starts leaning this way too much and then I just kind of move it over and I feel fresh again, you know. Um, and then, of course, the tongue too far forward. That's on my checklist. And, and I'll be feeling really bad in the middle of a song or something. And I move my tongue back, there it is, it feels great again. So if you know these things, you don't have stiff days, you know. Uh, you may feel stiff when you start warming up. But when you search for these things, I really believe, and it's not a warm up, it's called maintenance. Maintenance drills, you know, you start looking at that. So, to answer your question, my daily practice is more involved with searching every day. And I say that because I'm not a natural. Every day I have to find everything and put, it's like a, I guess, I think I've, I've used this analogy before. If you got a, a high performance car, Ferrari or something like that, you know, guys who can afford these cars usually have a mechanic in the garage every day tweaking it and tuning it up. So you need a tune up every day. If you're going to be a high performance musician, you need a tune up every day because a lot of stuff I do is, is pretty demanding, you know, and I, and, I, and yeah, it's just demanding. So I would just want to be, sure that I, I'm tuned up so I could be a high performance musician. And, and so my daily practice consists of that. It doesn't consist of picking up the horn and just going through the exercises. It's, it's a really a conscious effort to, to analyze. What am I doing today? And, and, and I think one of the important things to analyze and try to figure out is everybody who's having trouble, there's something that they're doing that's working against them. It's not that you don't have talent or that you're physically not built for it. There's something you're doing that's working against you. And if you could figure that out, like for instance, my problem with my teeth, you know, what was it? Tongue's too far forward. Tongue's too far forward is causing, it's getting in the way of the air. So the air wasn't getting through there and I was pushing harder and, and all this kind of stuff, you know, that was working against me. You fix that, then you could start fixing other things. And I think, when you pick up the horn for the first time in a day, you, you, and, 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 you, and this takes years because you gotta make checklists. And what's, what's working for me, what's working against me. And then after a while, you can start saying, this feels really terrible because I'm doing this. Okay, let me fix it. Now you feel great. And it's just like that, you feel fine once you identify what the problem is. You know, but it takes years to develop. You know, it took me seven, eight years to figure that out you know, when I started having a problem. So, no, that's great stuff. We're pretty much at the end of our time. Uh, this has been fantastic. Great to, after watching uh, yesterday in your master class, you gave some just really great big picture advice that everybody should really take to heart. We got to watch you play last night and see 
what you do, how you do it, which was terrific, really enjoyable. Today, it was a pleasure to get to hear you talk about your career, what you think, how you play. Um, anything you want to leave for us? I mean, it's, it's been fantastic. I've been kind of steering in because it's what I want to know. Is there anything that you would like uh, us to know? And then, because we're right near the end of our time, I want to give right. you some time. Sorry. We don't want to talk about that, do we? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, uh, you know, like I said, yeah, I ended yesterday's uh, talk, you know, saying that the music business is not for everybody. It, it, you know, you got to check your priorities. Uh, there's a lot of sacrifices, you know, and being, uh, there's no guarantees. It's not like you're going to get a job and they're going to guarantee you. $80,000 a year, and then you're gonna get a raise, and all. it's none of that. It's like my mother-in-law, for instance, uh, I've been married for 27 years. And my mother-in-law, to this day, it's inconceivable for her that a person would not know how much they're making from week to week. <laughs> it, this is like, but no, nah, I mean, to me, it's, this is what's exciting about my life. I don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow, and, and, and I've learned to trust and surrender to the will of a higher power because most of the stuff that happened to me in my career, I guarantee you, just fell on my lap through the grace of God, you know. Uh, you know, not everybody may believe in this or not, you know, but I don't think that I practiced any more than the next guy. And I certainly don't think I have more talent than the next guy you know, or that I have such a great personality or, you know, things just happened. And, and all I did was have a vision. And so I we talked about vision yesterday. You know, I, I offered up my vision and, and when I was ready, the doors opened. And, uh, and I think it has to do with a genuine desire to do something without any ulterior motives. You know, money, I always felt that money was a, was a perk for doing something that you wanted to do and dedicating yourself to it. And I don't know, there's no scientific proof of this stuff. I mean, they say the more you work at something, the more you draw in energy and all this, more positive energy you put in, the more, you know, I don't know what that is, but I have noticed the more I practice, the more I get work. It has nothing to do with, I mean, it may be work that I don't have to be good at, you know, because a lot of work out there that you could be not a great job of player, you know, but it just seems to come in, drawing work, drawing money. Um, and it all has to do with how much energy you put into something sincerely, because you want to, because you want to put it out, and you want to offer it to the world, and you want to connect with people, and all these things. And I, I don't know what it is metaphysically or, or what, but it brings back amazing opportunities for you to do, because everything just fell in my lap. I, I didn't work hard, in spite of myself, because like I said, I've made so many mistakes. Politically, jeez, oh, I'm not kidding. The first person I'll have an argument with is the contractor when they work, um, you know, and key musicians not getting along with them, and, and stuff like that. I I really tried to sabotage my own career, <laughs> and for some reason, I I I was shown another route to do what I do because I didn't do most of the stuff I did was not in the mainstream. Even American Idol, all these shows, these are not mainstream musicians. Ricky Minor was not a mainstream. The guy I'm working for now with Dancing with the Stars is not a mainstream musician. We don't work for mainstream contractors, you know. Um, I wish I would have, or I wish I still could, but I'm pretty much blacklisted in many areas, <laughs> you know. But uh, so I think it's grace of God. And uh, for those who, I mean, I know there's people that don't believe in this stuff and all that, but you got to remember, man, the more you put the emphasis on yourself, the more you can get yourself in trouble. You know, the more you think that you're in control, the more you realize as you get older, you're not in control. Something else, you can't control everything. So that's the controversial part of my, huh? my talk. Uh, I, I could just testify that things just happened for me. Well, well, thank you so much. Harry Kim, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much.